My name is Jeremy Myers. I'm a reconstructive urologist at the University of Utah Department of Surgery and the Center for Reconstructive Urology and Men's Health. I'd like to talk to you today about urinary diversion. Urinary diversion is simply where the bladder is no, long, no longer salvageable or needs to be removed for a variety of reasons, which could be cancer, could be complications from spinal cord injury or other neurologic disease. In urinary diversion, the bladder is typically removed either for cancer or in a simpler way to remove the bladder dysfunction and the possibility of having the bladder fill with infected material, which we call pyocystis. And then some type of bladder diversion is performed. This type of bladder diversion really varies from creating a simple stoma where patients have a bag on the surface of the skin to catch the urine and there's a small spigot at the bottom of the bag which drains out the bag when the bag fills. This is called a stoma. It's also referred to as a urostomy or also an ileal conduit. This type of surgery is the simplest surgery and it's often appropriate for older patients that don't want more extensive surgery that has higher complication rates. And it's also appropriate for patients that have a very complex abdomen and it may be difficult to create more sophisticated urinary diversion surgeries such as creating a brand new bladder for the patients to catheterize. Because of these reasons, this is actually the most common type of urinary diversion that we perform is an ileal conduit, colon conduit, or what's referred to as a urostomy surgery. The other type of surgeries that we perform create a new bladder that's made out of bowel. This can be a bladder that either a patient urinates spontaneously via their urethra, essentially normally, or it's a new bladder that sits up in the abdomen and they catheterize via a small catheterizable channel from the belly button. These types of surgeries are very serious surgeries. They involve opening the abdomen from the pubic bone to above the belly button typically. The bladder is removed in most cases and then the urostomy or the new bladder is created. The surgeries take anywhere from typically about three and a half to four hours up to eight to ten hours if a patient has a lot of damage and has a lot of previous abdominal surgeries. I'd like first to show you some slides and general information about the type of urinary diversion surgeries that can be performed and then we'll talk a little bit about the complication rates and what to expect with this type of surgery. So this is a slide set that I created on urinary diversion surgery and it goes over a few of the basics of urinary diversion. I hope you'll find this is informative. This is probably the simplest form of urinary diversion. It's what we call an ileovesicostomy. We very rarely do this, but I included it as some patients have questions about it. Essentially, the bladder here has a chimney created out of small bowel. So the small bowel segment is attached to the bladder. The bowel is connected behind it and then it comes up and creates a stoma. So when the bladder fills, it goes out the stoma and goes to an appliance or a bag that sits on the skin. The problem with ileovesicostomy, although this is controversial, is that it fails to resolve urinary tract infections in a lot of patients. And a lot of patients may need to be converted to an ileal conduit in the future where the bladder is removed for bladder complications. Some centers believe very strongly in ileovesicostomy. At University of Utah, we've done this in several cases, and we felt that the bladder doesn't drain that well, and patients can still be prone to problems with their bladder. And so generally, we recommend an ileal conduit. There are still some cases, however, where an ileovesicostomy can be advantageous. This is a basic type of urinary diversion. It's called an ileal conduit, also referred to as a urostomy. 
In this type of surgery, the bladder is removed, as I mentioned, and we take a segment of the small bowel leading up to the large bowel. This is referred to as the ileum, or the, and that's why this is referred to as an ileal conduit. Typically, the segment is about six to eight inches in length. We drop this out of the bowel, and then the bowel is reconnected either with staples or stitches. So no bowel content comes into the ileal conduit. Then the ileal conduit is brought up to the skin, typically on the right side, either above the belly button or below the belly button, and a little bit off to the side by about an inch to an inch and a half from the middle of the abdomen. Then the ureters, which have been disconnected from the bladder, those are the tubes that carry urine from the kidney, are connected to the backside of this conduit inside the abdomen. So any urine coming out of the kidney goes into the conduit and comes out of the skin. It doesn't store much urine at all. And then on the skin, there's a stoma appliance, which collects the urine into a bag with a small spigot at the bottom of the stoma appliance. That can be drained periodically or at night or during the day for that matter. It can be connected up to a leg bag, very similar to a Foley catheter or a suprapubic tube. This is one of the simplest urinary diversions that we perform. And it's most appropriate in elderly patients with a lot of medical problems or in patients with a very complex abdomen that don't feel they can undergo more sophisticated urinary diversions. Often we also make conduits out of large bowel, and the reason for this might be a patient that has a lot of previous surgery in the pelvis or has had a lot of radiation damage in the pelvis which has affected the small bowel over here. Typically we make this out of the colon, usually transverse colon, but we can use these segments of the colon, the descending colon or the ascending colon as well. And the colon is attached to the ureters, you can see here, and then brought up to the skin. Usually this stoma resides a little bit higher above the belly button, and it can be easily brought out either on the right side or the left side. This is called a colon conduit. Functionally, this works quite the same as an ileal conduit, Patients have a bag that's pasted around the colon conduit, and the urine drains very readily from the conduit out into the bag on the skin. This is an x-ray of the colon conduit. This is very uh, characteristic for the way colon looks. There's these haustra, as they're called, and this is the conduit connected up to a kidney and coming out to a stoma appliance. Here we can see the outline of the kidney, in this case, there was very little ureter, and so the colon was connected directly to the kidney rather than the ureter coming up to the colon. And that's why a colon conduit was used. There are a lot of long-term problems with conduits. This was a very nice study from the Mayo Clinic, which was reported quite a while ago, and it looked at 1,000 patients, and they followed these patients over time. Almost all of these patients were treated for bladder cancer, which is a big emphasis at Mayo Clinic. They looked at the complications, and almost everyone had a complication. In fact, 61% of the patients had a complication, and there was an average of 2.3 per patient. But only 6% of the complications required a reoperation. The types of complications that occurred were renal failure, 20% of patients had some element of decline in their renal function, and 2% of patients lost one of their kidneys. The other types of complications that they saw were bowel obstruction episodes. Fortunately, only a few of the patients required a reoperation for these bowel uh, obstruction episodes. Peristomal hernias, which is a hernia that develops next to the stoma, also occurred in about 14% of patients. And then a few patients had electrolyte problems or vitamin problems and required vitamin supplementation or treatment of too much acid in their blood, which is the electrolyte problems. Ureters also occasionally get scarred where they meet the bowel. This occurred in 10% of the patients, although we haven't observed 
uh, that high a number of ureteral scarring uh, in our series. The other type of bowel diversion that we do for when the bladder is removed is called an orthotopic neobladder. This is most commonly done in cancer patients. The reason it's not done in patients with neurologic disease like spinal cord injury, MS, etc., is that usually the urethra and the sphincters are not functional. And so patients will just continually leak from the urethra unless they have a total normal nerve input to the urethra and to the pelvis. And obviously in spinal cord injury, MS, and those other diseases, we don't have that. The most common ones that are performed are called the Studer pouch or the VIP pouch, but there are really a number of different types of neobladders that all function more or less the same. The general idea, and this is a VIP pouch, is that some type of spherical configuration is made of a small bowel, and then this is sewn to the urethral stump so patients can pee on their own or avoid spontaneously on their own and aren't dependent on catheterization and don't have a bag on the surface of the skin. In the VIP pouch, the bladder is rolled up into kind of a jelly roll or spherical configuration. It's folded over and made into this sphere. Then the ureters are plugged into the pouch and sewn in place. And then this is sewn to the urethral stump here in the pelvis and patients avoid on their own. A studer pouch is very similar. This uses a portion of the small bowel. It's opened up and then this side is folded over. And then you have this chimney that comes up where the ureters are plugged into the chimney. The theory of this is it prevents reflux of urine up into the ureters and may preserve the upper tracts or the ureters and kidneys from damage long term. That's controversial about whether that's needed or not. As I said, most of these uh, pouches are used only in bladder cancer patients. Here's a depiction of the pouch being sewn down to the urethral stump so patients can void spontaneously out the urethra from the pouch. The other type of bladder diversion that we perform is a continent catheterizable pouch. And this is what we mostly make in patients with neurologic disease or radiation to the pelvis. And the concept of this is that the pouch is out of the pelvis. It resides typically on the right side of the abdomen, in the mid to upper abdomen. And then a small stoma is created, not one that you have to use a bag on the skin surface, but one that comes to the abdominal wall or more commonly right to the base of the belly button. This stoma is about the size of a pencil eraser in diameter, and one slips a catheter, a temporary catheter, down this periodically, typically four to five times a day, and drains out the pouch. Then the catheter is removed and thrown away, and a fresh catheter is used the next time. This catheterization process takes maybe two to five minutes total and is uh, not too burdensome for patients. The advantage of this, again, is there's no external bag. Patients have typically a very unobtrusive stoma at the base of their belly button, and so it's a less obtrusive type of urinary diversion. The Indiana pouch is the most commonly utilized one at University of Utah and really across the country in my experience, and it's made from ascending colon and a small portion of the terminal ileum. The colon is opened up along its length after the bowels reconnected. Here you can see the reconnection of the small bowel to the large bowel. And then this large plate is folded over, creating an approximate sphere of bowel, which is the reservoir for the new bladder. Then this terminal ileum here will be reduced, and that will be the catheterizable channel. There's a natural valve that occurs here between the large bowel and the small bowel. That's called the ileocecal valve. And when that's tightened down, it works very well to prevent urine 
from leaking out of the terminal ileum and leaking from the stoma. That's a relatively rare complication. This is typically the terminal ileum is reduced with a stapler device and then it's reinforced across here to tighten up the valve. And here you can see the reinforcement sutures and the internal aspect of the valve within the cecum. This is a stoma that would be typically made with the right colon pouch. Early on, we typically made these on the abdominal wall, but very often now, we make them at the base of this belly button so they're a little bit less obtrusive. They do make a tiny bit of mucus because this is bowel at the, at the surface, and mostly patients will keep a little two-by-two two gauze taped over this to prevent this from staining their shirt or even keep just a Band-Aid over this. When these stomas are small and at the base of the belly button, this mucus typically doesn't cause much trouble at all, and often patients don't even need that small covering. I wanted to talk a bit about the complications that are associated with urinary diversion surgery. We do approximately 40 to 50 urinary diversions at the University of Utah each year at the Center for Reconstructive Urology and Men's Health. Additional urinary diversions are done at the Huntsman Cancer Institute for cancer patients. Most of the urinary diversions that we perform at the Center for Reconstructive Urology are done in patients with neurologic disease or radiation damage rather than bladder cancer. Our rate of complications uh, is comparable to other centers across the United States. In all comers, the rate of death from these types of surgeries is approximately 3 to 4 percent. A lot of patients are elderly or have radiation damage and don't have much choice about undergoing urinary diversion. These patients are at a little bit higher risk for having a complication, like even dying from a complication that they occur that occurs during surgery or after surgery. We also have a 10 percent rate of needing to return to the operating room for some problem after surgery within six weeks of surgery. The types of problems we might see is urinary leakage or leakage from where we attach a ureter to the new bladder. Another complication that we see is wound complications where patients get a bad infection within the wound and this has to be drained out within the operating room. Bowel obstruction can also occur and sometimes leads to the need to return to the operating room for some problem. We're very conservative about letting patients go from the hospital, and we really only let them leave the hospital when we feel that they'll do well at home or in a subacute rehab facility. But even so, we have about a 20 to 25 percent readmission rate after the surgery. Patients typically spend anywhere from 7 to 14 days in the hospital, but can spend as long as three weeks in the hospital. The readmissions occur from bad urinary infections or a bowel obstruction, vomiting. Sometimes they're not serious and patients just need hydration or antibiotics. Other times they may need an operation, as I mentioned before. There's a number of other long-term complications that we'll discuss with you if you need urinary diversion, if you come for a consultation at University of Utah. These types of things are hernias, bowel obstruction, uh, et cetera. It's very important to review these complications so you know uh, the potential risks of this type of surgery. Most patients that undergo this surgery, unfortunately, don't have much choice. Their bladder dysfunction is ruining their lives or they have serious complications from their bladder dysfunction like loss of kidney function or decubitus pressure ulcers that are complicated by urinary leakage. Every patient is unique. These surgeries are no doubt very serious, but if you need urinary diversion surgery, we have a lot of experience and we've seen a lot of very difficult cases and we'd be happy to talk to you about the complications and what could be done for your case.